on chapter 11. Uh, so this kind of is where uh, the environmental stuff comes in with homology. We're going to be talking about um, endangered, threatened species, what causes that, and how we can conserve those species. So biodiversity and, like I said, conservation efforts. Um, here's some nice wildebeest. Hello, wildebeest. Uh, so the, the Serengeti, um, there is a park. It's uh, 30,000 kilometers squared, brings 800,000 people a year in Tanzania. Um, but Tanz the Tanzanian government wants to build a highway across it. Um, we have a huge interstate system in the United States, and that's really benefited us as far as commerce. And then um, there's some national safety things. That's where we got the idea. We got it from uh, Eisenhower, got the idea from Hitler because he thought the Autobahn was awesome and it helped with transport during World War II. History for today, hi, Phil. Um, so anyway, Tanzania would like to build a highway across um, if you look, I'll kind of turn the lights off so you can see a little bit better. Um, if you look, the proposed highway, this red road right here, it actually goes through um, this uh, park, this Serengeti National Park right here. And so um, what you're doing is, you know, when you do that, you end up doing what's called fragmenting the habitat. When you uh, cut a, a road or a highway bridge, whatever, across a habitat, you make it difficult for um, the wildlife to get back and forth across that area. Um, we're in a we're in a unique place. We like to judge other countries and say, "Oh, the Serengeti is beautiful, and the wildebeest deserve you know a pristine habitat." But we have highway system across the entire country that we live in. So you know, who are we to judge? I always like to keep that in mind. But here's Tanzania. It's a, it's a little south of the Horn of Africa. So um, anyway, talking about habitat um, fragmentation and stuff um, is kind of the topic. So anyway, biodiversity, we already talked about this. You have different species. Within a species, you have a, um, the genetic diversity and richness within that one type of organism. And then how many different population and populations and communities you have present. We already discussed that. So like I said, ecosystem diversity. How many different kinds of ecosystems? Here we have an aquatic ecosystem. It would be a river ecosystem. A little bit of forest and some mountainous area. Um, then how many different species do you have? And then within a single species, um, what is the richness of genes? So, species, we already know that. Um, when we look at species diversity, um, we want to see how many we have that's called richness. And then, um, even this is also important for biodiversity. We could have 20 different um, species of frogs present in an ecosystem, but what, um, what about if 15 of those only had five or less um, individuals of that species present? But maybe two of those two species had you know, hundreds. So it wouldn't be very even. Yes, sir? What's the difference between the species diversity and biodiversity? Um, biodiversity is a larger umbrella term, and it could go and talk species? about the, um, it could be referring to the number of communities present. Okay, so biodiversity includes species richness, but then also how many com communities you have present, and then um, how many different kinds of ecosystems, too. So species diversity is more of a specific. Yes, yeah, so species diversity is going to be talking so about the numbers. Yes, well, you could measure all three. But species diversity is the number of species present, but then also uh, how even those species are as far as, you know, how many of each type you have. Um, so species diversity is kind of a sub-level of biodiversity. Does that kind of make sense? All right, so um, subspecies. These are, um, this uh, the best example of subspecies I can give to you would be like a tiger. Like you have a Siberian tiger, but then you also um, may have, um, I'm trying to think of the type of tiger that lives in uh, kind of India. There's, yeah, so there's like seven different kinds. But a Bengal tiger, that's the one I was thinking of. So those are both tigers. They could interbreed and have offspring, but they are, um, they're going to be slightly different because they're geographically separated. That's not a huge deal. Um, what you do have, and this happens with tigers, I actually saw uh, a Siberian tiger. There, I don't know if you've ever seen the Siberian tiger that kind of has a mushed almost looks sort of like a Down syndrome sort of face where they have inbreeding problems. Um, once you get down to just having um, a few um, uh, organisms with a species left, um, a lot of times those captive breeding programs will have problems with inbreeding because if you only have five tigers or whatever um, left, then they have to mate and they may be um, too genetically similar because they're related. Um, so that's called inbreeding oppression. It can also be, you know, if you live in <coughs> Alabama and you're sad about having to marry your cousin. <laughs> and reading depression. So, that's the best I got for you today. And I got
got it on film, so sorry. Um, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, yeah. Although, I don't think anybody at Alabama was watching the tape about this. Um, so, <laughs> um, genetic diversity, like I said, this is, um, this is a big deal because if something does happen in the environment, remember, um, when we're talking about natural selection, it's not always the biggest and strongest that are best suited. It's who's the best suited to the environment. So, the more... Um, diversity with the, you have within the genes of a single species, the more raw material you have, you know, to adapt to those local conditions. Um, and that's kind of common sense, but I thought I'd bring it up. Our right, ecosystem diversity, straightforward. Um, when we look at the types of organisms that are present on Earth, um, this is a giant ant coming to eat you. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but this just shows that when we look at the number of, uh, as far as species richness, um, we're going to have a lot more types of insects than we are in fungi, plants. Um, these are to scale versus, you know, the number of mammals uh, or look how many roundworms there are. There's a lot of bacteria, lots of different kind of mollusks. Um, a lot of times we like to um, anthropomorphize. Uh, we, like, we like to protect animals that remind us of ourselves because uh, anthropomorphize means we find like human-like traits in animals and we like to protect them like panda bears are pretty and they have like human-like faces and they, they, they nurse their young and they're cute so we want to take care of them more than like the endangered mollusks so that's what I mean um, even though that when we look at the number there's really not that many mammals um, we go over here and kind of zoom in a little bit do you have a quick question Christian? no? okay um, so here is um, of all life, here's animals, that is the most abundant, and then of the animals you can see that insects are most abundant. Um, and then if we look at just the vertebrates having a backbone, still mammals are, you know, really outweighed by something like fishes. So, But we like to protect the mammals because they're pretty. Um, anyway, how many different species are on Earth? We don't really know. We can't really count them because of the sheer number, but then also because we have this um, extinction <coughs> happening right now. This uh, sixth mass extinction, so we can't really count them. Um, sometimes small organisms are e easily overlooked, but I, I follow like the Sierra Club and like the Rainforest Alliance, and they'll always, once or twice a week, I'll see a report of a new salamander species found here, or sometimes it'll even be like a primate, like they'll find a new species of, you know, weird little monkey somewhere, you know. So uh, it's kind of interesting, um, and then God only knows how many different kinds of mushrooms that we hadn't found, you know, or, or studied. Um, what? I'm sorry? We're going to call monkeys weird. Sorry. Um, they're, I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing the monkeys. So anyway, um, latitudinal gradient. This is really important. I feel like I put a picture. I did. Um, this is really an important idea. Um, we had talked about a couple things with latitude already. The first thing we had talked about is if we were, you know, in Mexico, we climbed a mountain. As we climbed the mountain, we would go through the same, uh, as we, as we climbed the mountain in Mexico, then going up the mountain, right? We would go through the same transition in biomes as if we walked to Canada. Remember, you would go through like a grassland and a forest and then like a tundra and then, you know, they'd be at the top of the mountain. Well, also, when we're looking at species richness, the closer to the equator we are, these dark colors here, um, this red and orange, we have um, within this uh, area the different number of bird species. So we have, um, you know, 500, 600 down here closer to the equator. And as I go up to the poles, you know, notice I'm in the hundreds now, um, and now 50, 30, um, there's a lot of, this is a kind of wetland, marshy area where a lot of birds will migrate to. Um, this is, by the way, in case you don't know, um, this is the north slope of Alaska. Where, this is the north slope of Alaska. That's where we're looking at mines for oil. And there's this beautiful wetland area where caribou and then migrational birds will go there and live. And so we're like, who cares about the north slope of Alaska? A lot of migrational animals do. Um, and so we'll go drill there. It causes habitat loss for them. Anyway, but you can see there's this latitudinal gradient. Gradient just means change, okay? Um, as we go to the poles, then back down to the equator, you can see these numbers getting larger. Um, and then at the equator, there's the most. And the reason for that is because of just the sheer number of primary production that can happen at the poles. You have more food sources and you have more precipitation. And so there's going to be more niches. If we look over here, actually, um, Speaking of that, at tropical latitudes, uh, these are how small the niches are. 
So you have specialist species. You have all these different kinds of trees and all these moisture levels, different parts. You know, you have the canopy, the subcanopy, you have the forest floor, you know, all the different parts of a rainforest, for example. Um, but then when we get up to the tundra, you have a lot of different parts of the freaking snow. So, you know, there's not, <laughs> the, the ditches aren't going to be as specialized because there's not as many, um, the, um, well, there's just not as many uh, parts of the forest. There's not as many uh, places to live. There's not as many jobs to do in the ecosystem. So anyway, you can see that the niches are much larger. You're going to have more, uh, you're going to typically have more general species and less species. So um, how, do you, how do you feel about that? It's a pretty important um, kind of trend in the data. I'm sorry? Blue niches. Yay! Very yes. Well, um, so extinction and extirpation. I already talked about these. Extirpation is that localized extinction. Um, and then we also have, this is really important, um, <clears throat> but I already said it, but I'm saying it again. Most of the species that have ever lived have already gone extinct, but um, today we are 100 to 1,000 times um, faster as far as the extinction rate. Um, it's going 100 to 1,000 times faster than this normal background extinction rate due to evolution. Um, and so that's an issue. Yes? Oh, yes, sir? Um, I know there was a documentary that said, uh, I think it was something like in 20 years, 50% of the species would be extinct. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's just a prediction. Um, and then a lot of times you have to always, anytime you're looking at environmental data or any kind of scientific data, you have to look at it through a critical eye. And so um, there was probably several numbers out there available to the filmmakers, but because they were trying to make a point, they probably picked the most radical one. And, you, you know, and I'm okay with that, but you just have to know that before you start. That's 50% of the species we have now. Yes. And, and so... Um, it's probably in the 90s. I mean, I don't know. You've gone through different ice ages and things, but you'd have to look that up. Um, let me know what you find out. So anyway, we've had five mass extinctions. We've already talked about these. Moving on. Um, so humans have driven hundreds of species to extinction um, since humans have been around. Um, and, you know, human evolution has been happening for two to three million years. The actual um, human species, we're looking at less than 100,000, though. So, anyway, um, dodo bird, passenger pigeon, we, we killed these. Uh, and so there are other ones, condors, whooping cranes, that are on the brink of extinction, so they would be endangered at this point. Um, so, yes, sir? How did the dodo bird go? The dodo bird um, did not, could not fly, and it knew no predators similar to how people killed them. They had no, they weren't really, as far as I'm, I mean, I don't know everything about everything, but as far as I know, they were not frightened by the people, and they did not, um, they had no defenses, and they, they really um, were very easy to kill. They were a nice little quick snack because they couldn't fly, and they were, they're kind of just clumsy and slow, but, um, is that similar to the story that you heard? Yeah. Okay. Well, all right, so, um, there's a red list, and these are, um, the kind of the most at risk. So, anyway, in the United States in the last 500 years, 236 animals, 30 plant species have been confirmed at St. And, you know, the actual number is probably higher than that. That's not super important. Um, habitat loss. Okay, so this is where our hip hippo C comes in. It's on the AP exam, it's, this is the thing. It's just you got to know this. Um, habitat loss is the number one cause. I put up like three fingers for no reason. But habitat loss is the number one cause for um, biodiversity loss. And so that is the thing. And so what ends up happening, you can destroy the habitat. Like let's say if we say we did some logging, that would be destruction. Fragmentation would be like the building of that highway that would cause the, um, if it was a mobile organism, not to be able to get back and forth. Um, but, so, and then they could just be degraded. And so, by degra uh, degrading a habitat, that could be something like how the oceans are becoming more acidic as we put carbon dioxide into them. Um, so, it doesn't have to be completely gone, but it could be a, a sub, sub quality. Um, so, anyway, um, habit habitat developments, farming, 
farming uh, civil class communities, you have a, a, a wild grassland that could have 20 different native species of grasses and now you've planted just corn. So obviously that's simplified. Uh, grazing is going to modify the grassland structure because you're going to have invasive species. And so um, when you graze, all the tasty, yummy native grasses get eaten to the ground and so then the weeds that are less tasty, um, they, they thrive and do well. Um, so clearing forests um, removes resources. And then dams, like if you take a dam and you put it up, you don't have a river anymore, you have a lake. So you still have water, but that's not the same ecosystem. So that's not, um, that's not gonna lend itself to um, those river organisms continuing to thrive. Um, so fragmentation, uh, going into that a little bit more, that's where we take, we're looking at that mosaic. Remember I showed you the patches in the mosaic and the ecotone was like that boundary. I'm ringing some bells there, make sure you know those words. Um, so fragmentation is where you're going to break up the habitats into what's called these patches. Um, and so then you have the issue of are the patches large enough to buy the resources and then again the safety of organisms that are mobile getting from one patch to another. Um, so anyway, um, species, some species may need a large area, maybe they migrate and so they have issue there. Um, so let me show you how the fragmentation process works. So we have an original forest, and then notice as we do some logging here, um, we're going to start getting these patches here and here and here, and then you have these undeveloped parts. Um, where in places, and even in the United States, where we do a lot of hunting, you know, when you start to fragment habitats, it, it removes that cover. So things, and, and even if you're not hunting it, maybe a bird is hunting a, a mouse or something, if they, you're removing that protective layer of kind of camouflage there. So then the patches get smaller and then they get even smaller and um, they become more isolated. And depending on that species range, how much uh, land they actually need, that can be problematic. So, um, habitat loss has happened in every biome. The one biome that has declined the most is prairies, and that's because of agriculture. They have the best soil. Remember I told you guys that grasslands have the best soil. You have to know that. Um, but because they have the best soil and they don't have trees that have to be cut down, they are the most um, um, at risk for um, getting developed. So anyway, um, yeah, some species like pigeons and rats, mm, they benefit from human development, but that's not, you know, always nice. So temperate grassland, most developed chaparral next. Chaparral, got the wine and the grapes, right, um, and the olives. So it's very nice climate. People like to live there. Plus, it's usually coastal, so you have that going into effect. Um, temperate deciduous, that's where we live. Tropical dry, then savanna, then desert, tropical rainforest, temperate rainforest. And then the tundra is undisturbed because, you know, nobody really wants to live in the tundra. Yes, sir? Why is the desert so, like, what's going on in the desert? Is that, is that a lot of, the, if you think about people that live in the desert current day, a lot of them, um, they, they're they going to have, um, like with the you know, Mesopotamia and Fertile Crescent, you're going to have those rivers that can provide the flood land. But then also, just thinking about today in the economy, a lot of desert company countries are fueled by fuel companies. Mm -hmm. Right, so if you think about the Middle East, for example, that's where your petroleum resources are found. There's a lot of big cities because of petroleum. Um, and so dams make it possible too. Right. Uh, so pollution and over harvesting. These are two of our hippo C letters. Um, I don't really feel like I need to talk a whole lot about that, uh, except to say that. Have I told you guys about K and K and R selected species, kangaroos and roaches? Did that happen? No. Okay, so this is, I'll just tell you real quick. Um, it's part of the population, um, it's part of the population part that we didn't talk about, so it's not a huge deal. I'm going to tell you about it. But cane selective species are like kangaroos. They take care of the babies, they keep them in their little pouches. People are cane selected. Um, so they have few offspring, but they're large and they live a long time. And so that makes them more um, desirable uh, for hunting, right? Because you're going to get a bigger food source. Our selected species are like roaches. See how I'm using the letters there? Our selected are like roaches or frogs or um, lobsters. I mean, things that don't really take care of their young and have a lot of offspring. So what our selected, if we do overhunt them, they can populate very quickly because they don't take care of their young and they have 
lot of things. So, and um, anyway, cave selected species, those large desirable organisms, they're more at risk. So elephants are case selective species. I mean, they're pregnant for longer than humans. Aren't they pregnant for like 18 months or something? And then they have one offspring, and they have a very long life cycle. So um, also having something um, desirable like tusks, like a hide, like uh, body parts that we use in medicine, um, that makes you more vulnerable to being over-harvested. Yes, sir? Any um, recently found and burned like a huge yes. stockpile of, of ivory. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's like right um which is it's kind of like it's sad you want to take that market away but then it's sad that they died for yeah. i don't want to say for nothing but um anyway so any non-native species we talk about invasive species that's the eye and the hippo seat um and so the, the issue is they can um out compete um, they can outcompete native species um because they're competing for resources and they may be um better at using those resources. They may also have less predators. And so, um, anyway, is this one of the FRQs? That, yeah, is this one of the FRQs for this unit? This is one eventually, if not this unit. Uh, talking about the um, invasive species. Is, did, Daniel, did you say already? Was this one of them? Uh, yeah, I think we're, uh, well, I didn't do the FRQs. I was going through the notes. Yeah. So, make sure that you... Make sure you study those before the test. Next time, don't panic. You see, send me an email. All right, so uh, climate change is the C in Hippocene. Uh, when you have climate change, you're going to have a couple issues happening. You're going to have more severe storms, and so that can in increase stress, especially in coastal regions. Um, things like flooding can be more um, prevalent than normal. Melting sea ice uh, could be... Um, threatening habitat, um, please be careful. Um, on the AP exam, they may ask you to identify an endangered species, and polar bears are not endangered. So if you put that, you will not get credit. Polar bears are, um, I don't even know if they're technically threatened at this point, but what's happening though, um, they swim and they kind of rest on the sea ice, and the sea ice is becoming less common, so they're having to swim longer distances without eating or resting, and especially with the nursing mother bears, um, it can cause them to be undernourished and then not be able to provide enough milk for their young. Anyway, um, if you're asked to provide an endangered species, do you know one? Do you seem to know one? Do you want me to tell you one? Like every every sea turtle that lives in Georgia. So like a loggerhead sea turtle. Can you remember that? Or every kind of tiger, Siberian tiger. Just like just know one, and it's not a polar bear. Yes. I think so. So elephants are fine. But then you have to like. I want to look at the keys for that one. Like you have to say Asian elephant or African elephant. So Siberian tiger, hoghead turtle, African elephant. All tigers. So all tigers are in danger. But when you go to say it, right, you have to say what kind. So just in your mind, get an endangered species and let it be your endangered species. Like on the FRQs, when you're taking this, they may ask you for one example of an invasive species, one example of an endangered species. So anyway, um, there's my little polar bear, and so they, they rest on the sea ice, like I said, and so these little chunks of floating ice are becoming fewer and far between. Um, amphibians are vanishing. They are more susceptible because um, they do live in aquatic ecosystems. So with climate change, you have less uh, water. You have drought in some places, and then also um, they can soak in some toxins through their semi-permeable skin. Yes, sir? Is it just like a common misconception, or were polar bears ever endangered? They were endangered at one point, yes. Um, but the college board will use that to trick you. Um, then I'm trying to help you out. So anyway, um, amphibians, I kind of already mentioned that. Here's amphibians again. Amphibians are becoming endangered. Um, part of it is habitat loss, pollution, fires, invasive species, diseases. So just straight back to that hippo sea idea. Um, nope. So biodiversity gives us these ecosystem services. You guys already feel pretty comfortable with ecosystem services, things that are best for free, pollination, water purification, uh, making oxygen, cycling nutrients, making soil. And so when we have biodiversity, um, it's going to increase that uh, stability and resistance uh, because you have the organisms there that are um, cycling the nutrients that are purifying the water and the soil, making soil, I should say. Um, when you have, especially
especially if you lose a, a keystone species, those species that are really important, more important to the ecosystem than uh, it, you would expect for the number that are there. Um, they can have the, that trophic cascade, especially if you're a top predator where the trophic levels underneath um, fall apart. And then we have things like ecosystem engineers, which in, sometimes can be even classified as keystone species. But those ecosystem engineers like beavers or um, even uh, like prairie dogs, they aerate the soil, the prairie dogs do, and then also beavers like dam up the rivers. Yes, sir? Okay, um, good, I guess. So, oh, we were going to ask me what prairie dogs did. No, I was going to ask other examples of keystone species besides like the yellow so, and the So, sea otters is like the one. I mean, there are others, but those are the two that I've seen over and over and over again. So, is that's... Sea, oh, uh, is sea otter like a, like a genetic description, or is that a um, That's... As, but it has a longer scientific name, but if you say that, that'll be fine. Um, so... Anyway, uh, agriculture is, a, is, is important. What ends up happening with um, the crops and biodiversity, uh, we have taken, you know, thousands of different crop strains, and we have um, just really picked the ones that we like the best, that look nice, that taste okay, that have good shelf lives. And so 90% of our food is coming from these 15 crops and 8 animal species. And so if something should happen to, like corn, for example, it's something we should have a maybe some kind of um, drought problem or like our water in the Midwest that we're using to irrigate. Should that be um, threatened, we're already overusing it, but maybe we could go back to the native strains of corn, find the genes that help to uh, prevent um, or make a, a crop more drought resilient, or we could actually, if we have a pest problem, we can go back to those native strains and pull the genes that we need. Yes, sir? How recent is this PowerPoint? One year old. Um, so a lot of this, the like stevia and then like monk fruit, they're still working on that. But this is just a year old. Um, so anyway, um, wheat crops, uh, about fifty billion dollars worth of disease resistance was was um, received from the wild wheat. Um, and so these wild and rare species, they could improve our food security. They may be more disease resistant. They may be able to. You could maybe water them with seawater, which is too saline, too salty for regular crops. Um, maybe they could uh, be perennials where you don't have to plant them every year. Perennial means you don't have to replant. Annuals have to be planted every year. That's how you can remember that. That's your, like a life school for you today. Um, anyway, so these are some <laughs> food sources that we could uh, further exploit should we need to. Um, Organisms, as far as biodiversity and what's important, they provide drugs and medicines to us. Um, many of our modern medicines, I mean, the most famous one being like aspirin. Um, you're a mess. Um, what did you say? Now, put that down. Um, so, even aspirin is uh, derived from a plant, right? And so, um, if you've ever used sal uh, salicyclic acid, which is for acne, that's also derived from a plant. Um, there's a lot, most of our, I don't want to say most, but a lot of our um, drugs are derived from plants. And what ends up happening is chemists can isolate those in the lab and then make them artificially, but the chemical itself, the idea, came from a plant. And so that's, like, we don't continue to, I forget the kind of tree that's made for aspirin, or aspirin came from, but we don't continue to, like, cut those trees down. We, we're making that artificially in the lab. Do they grow? What, how they grow penicillin is they take and they have genetically modified bacteria to secrete that and then they grow it. Same thing with insulin. Right, but they still, I think they genetically modify <laughs> organisms to make it faster. I know that's what they've done with, um, like I said, insulin. So like we used to have to get insulin from animals, but like we've genetically engineered bacteria to make it for us. It's like super crazy. Yes, sir? Aren't opiates like pounding plants? Yes, opiates, right. And so those are painkillers. But then again, now we're making them artificially. Um, and when I say artificially, I'm saying that we were able to hone in on those parts of the molecules and then create them. Most all opiates are better. That's, yes, that's what I was saying. Um, so anyway, um, pineapples, um, 
Um, I actually have brought, bought bromelain before. It's from Pineapple Sis for um, swelling. I had surgery and it worked. Um, so anyway, there's other things. The, the point is, the take home message is, um, if we lose biodiversity before we have time to fully research it, we could be losing potential sources of medicines or food. So anyway, um, another big idea for um, biodiversity and another argument for preserving it is ecotourism. And so when you have these pristine areas that haven't been fully developed, um, you can have, like, for example, in Tanzania, that wildlife that's present in the Serengeti. That could bring in a lot of money. And, and a lot of times, if you think about it, if you name all the developed countries on the equator, yeah, man, you're done because there's none, okay? Um, where we have this higher biodiversity, because you have the higher primary production, these developing countries can benefit from income from people coming to visit. So rainforest in Costa Rica, Australia has a great barrier reef. Belize has a lot of cool things. If you haven't been to Belize, you should go. Um, it is um, in Central America, uh, you know, sort of south of um, Mexico, but north of South America. So... <laughs> That doesn't help. That's Central America. Well, I, I, but you know, people don't know what Central America is. Like, yeah. you can't take anything for granted on what people know. Um, trust me. Trust me there. Um, so, uh, people, the tourism, um, it's a really powerful incentive because people really like money, turns out. And so, they can see the tourist income um, from people coming to visit. And that was kind of neat on the movie that we have watched where they had the large uh, manta rays that were... Uh, present. It was in Indonesia, I think, um, and so the people were protecting them, and they uh, were getting the money from that instead of um, hunting them for for um, just the fishing. Biophilia, people liked nature. They need it. Eh. I don't know what that is. I don't think I'd be looking at it, though. I'm just saying. Um, people are part of this bigger thing. Okay. Um, conservation biology, I don't need to talk about that a whole lot. It's pretty straightforward. Pretty neat job. Don't make a lot of money, but it would be like rewarding. Um, and so they go out and sample. And these are the people that do the population monitoring, uh, that tag things, uh, that try to estimate populations. And we'll get into that next unit. Um, so Endangered Species Act. There's like, by the time we get done this semester, we saw a lot of these really important laws. I, I don't remember the chapter, maybe chapter six or seven, when we did the concept map. So this was one of those, um, but I'm going to go through them kind of as we study this. But Endangered Species Act is um, really, really important. You have to know it. And you can't just know ESA. You have to know the letters, uh, or excuse me, the words for the letters. So it prevents the government um, and citizens from taking any action that could threaten not just the species, but its habitat. So that's what the Endangered Species Act is. Um, and so if you, this is where the takings clause of the, if the amendment comes in, if you have an endangered species on your property, you can't develop in such a way, like if it was a, an owl, for example, um, and you had a chorus that you wanted to log, you could not log it um, because of the owl there. They would have to fairly compensate you, but um, that the Endangered Species Act forbids you from disrupting their habitat. Yes, sir? This is kind of semantics, I'm sorry, but is, do you know if the Endangered Species Act is law or an executive order? This is a law. This was passed by the by Congress. Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, um, we have 1,118 endangered species uh, listed and 322 listed as threatened. And so, um, that's a lot, obviously. And the neat thing is it's not just things that we think are cute. It's also, it also could be, you know, trees and flowers and, you know, fungi. Um, anyway, we have, um, this has helped, okay? Um, but on the flip side, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service and the, uh, the Fishery Service, they're both underfunded, so it makes it really hard to, to always do this. So, um, the, the greater sage grouse, this guy, I actually saw these like in real person. Um, turns out, do you guys know about fracking? Have you heard of that? Yeah. Where they go in and do the natural, nat, natural gas drilling? Uh, that's done on your public land that you own as a, as a U.S. citizen that your parents pay taxes to. They, they frack that land and then the, um, the companies, the gas companies, do have to pay a royalty to the federal government, but it's pretty low cost. Anyway, that sage grouse right there, this guy on the right hand side, he's really cute. They nest um, in a lot of, and I, I went 
and I saw where they nested, and then I saw just surrounding me, just completely surrounding me, all these natural gas wells, and they were making all this noise and disturbed the sage grouse. Um, I would, mine doesn't talk about it. I think I'm going to look it up because at that point there was this, it was two summers ago I went out west and saw this, um, there was this debate on whether they were endangered or not because if they were listed as endangered, then that drilling would have to stop there. And so there was this huge uproar on, oh, they're totally fine because um, it would cause them under the Endangered Species Act to have to stop tracking them. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I hate doing work. No, no worries. Um, so I'm going to look up the greater sage grouse here in a minute because I was I was curious about it and I, I I wanted to look it up but I didn't get around to it. So anyway, some people um, there's this little nice adage here: shoot, shovel, and shut up. An adage is just a, a, a saying. Um, but anyway, um, if a you know an endangered species is present, you know you don't want to even talk about it because in, that inhibits you from using your land. Um, species at risk, that's not as important. This is important. Sites or societies, depending on who you're talking to. Um, this is the Convention on the International Trade of um, Endangered Species. So you have to have that memorized, the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species. Um, sites or societies, you can say that, but you do have to know what the letters stand for. Um, and so this would be the kind of treaty that would help to prevent the trade of ivory, for example, or um, a lot of the tropical parrots and uh, parakeets that are uh, people want to have as pets because they're weird. Like they want them a call. Okay, whatever. Those look like they would bite your nose off. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> but this would be um, this would be the treaty or that conventional law that would help to prevent that. Um, and so we did sign this, and we're part of it. Um, it's helped, but it's not completely solved the problem, obviously. Um, so the goal is to conserve biodiversity, um, and it has helped with things like ecotourism. So, but certainly it's not one hundred percent effective. All right, um, we don't need to talk about that. Captive breeding is something that has to be done when your um, population gets down to that critical level. For example, the condors of California. Um, they were. Um, They've been reintroduced and they've recovered from 22 to 230. That's pretty cool. Uh, black rhinos were reintroduced to um, the Serengeti National Park. I, I don't know if in the PowerPoint I have it, but I have like a picture of one sedated, like going for a helicopter ride. Um, and then also, like with the wolves, they were reintroduced. Yeah, there it is. I got to show you this. I just thought this is for turning a lot of work. So there's my little rhino friend. Yeah. <laughs> What? I guess that was the most secure way of transporting him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's sedated. For sure. For sure. Hand puppets. Yeah, they got, I want to be the conservation biologist that gets to wear that condor hand puppet. That's fine. That's pretty neat. I mean, they're just trying to keep them from being exposed to too much human contact, so then they're reintroduced there. Okay. Um, cloning is um, up for debate. There's ethical problems with that, right? And so you can take DNA and insert it into a closely related species um, and also kind of do like a surrogate sort of um, ish, uh, kind of. Let's say, I don't even, I'm going to give like an example. Like if you had a mammal that was going. Uh, extinct and you wanted to say that you could clone one that was living and put that egg in, I don't know, um, if it was, I mean, something that was uh, some kind of deer, maybe like a cow could do the gestation for it. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> or so No, a closely related <laughs> mammal. <laughs> What's your question, Connor? Do you support cloning? Um, I think that, um, I did see in the news, um, uh, there was just recently approved, I think a scientist, I want to see in the UK, was approved to do some cloning research on humans. Yeah. So, um, this is, cloning animals all, has been done, it's been done for a while now, probably close to 20 years. Um, I don't have a problem with cloning, I, I mean, I don't, I don't. When you get to people, that's sort of a gray area. Yeah. With endangered species, though. And then, also, like, there is this debate of whether a species that's endangered, are they really worth saving? Like, is that really, 
like pandas, they have those that try to captive breed them. They just won't. Like they're just never in the mood, you know. Yeah, um, can't they do it like, they like, like sh- once every year on like one day? No, no, I'm. I gotta tell you something. Just like a So anyway, um, without ample habitat and protection, the wild clone animals in a zoo doesn't really do any good. You're not solving the problem. It's more of a a band-aid or a temporary fix because you're not getting to the root problem that caused the endangerment in the first place. Um, If you have poaching, forensics can help. Umbrella species. So umbrella species, um, there's uh, flagship species and umbrella species. It's really... It, that's a semantic issue, and they're very similar. Semantic is just like, what word did you pick to use? Um, what are, how many SAT words have I talked about today? I'm up to like eight now. Um, anyway, semantics of that, though. An umbrella species, something like a panda, right? They're cute. They're large. They need a pretty good amount of habitat. So when I protect the panda, I'm also protecting uh, whatever, you know, little bird might live in the bamboo or whatever kind of, you know, soil bacteria might be there, and then whatever kind of fungi might be there. So that's an umbrella species. Uh, species. Like I said, it's very similar. I mean, to me, very similar to a flagship species in that you know, they're charismatic. People like them. Like the World Wildlife Fund has a panda. You probably are all have seen that. Um, and and the usually, like I said, there are things that are anthropomorphized that people can see similarities to. You know, people don't care much about, people kind of care about birds, but they care more about mammals. They like dolphins, pandas, people like polar bears. But, like, why are they better than, you know, a frog? Because they look, people like them, and they look like people. Um, so, anyway, um, we have parks that help to protect things. Um, sometimes they're set aside, but they're not always used for that. This is very interesting. A um, couple things to think about when you talk about park. A park um, can't really protect animals that leave those premises, uh, premises. and then also with climate change, um, let's say we have um, some kind of protection, uh, like Yellowstone, that's a huge park, it's, um, I think it's larger than like World Island, uh, but you know, if we're talking about the bison and the wolves, as that area continues to warm, those, would, those organisms would naturally want to go north to get to colder temperatures. But the area north of that is not a park. And so the area north of that is already owned by somebody, maybe a rancher that has cows. And so that rancher has already got his land. The park's already set aside. Climate changes, though, and those organisms will want to move, and they won't be protected anymore. It's pretty interesting. It's kind of it's terrifying, you know, to um, biodiversity hotspots. This is on the test, like, maybe twice. Um, so um, when we have a biodiversity hotspot, the, there's a couple things that you have to know about them. Uh, they have a large amount of endemic species, so so those species that aren't found anywhere else. And um, here's the numbers, and it must have been 70% um, de- degraded due to humans. And so that's what a biodiversity hotspot is. Um, pretty interesting statistics here. 2.3 of the plants, plant the planet's land surface contains about 50% of the world plant species. So. Um, if we focus on these hot spots, you're going to kind of get figuratively the biggest bang for your buck because they have so many endemic species and so much biodiversity. So that's a biodiversity hot spot. They're typically going to be closest to the equator, right? Because that's where we have the most biodiversity anyway. Um, and so if I look at these biodiversity hot spots, um, Typically, normal climates, right? So here's my equator. goes right above the fat part of Brazil. And so coastal areas um, typically will have higher biodiversity. Um, But, you know, if you look, here's about, you know, that's around 40 degrees north. There's not a whole lot above that. Um, This chaparral uh, region around the Mediterranean has some good biodiversity. But... Like I said, mostly warmer climates, coastal climates. Um, right. Um, it's also going to have, because it's an island co- country, it's going to have a lot of endemic species. 
So island species, islands are going to have more endemic species. So remember we had talked about restoration. Restoration is where we put it back. And I'm not going to highlight it because it's important. Restoration is different than something like reclamation. Reclamation, we had a landfill and we're going to make it a park now. Like it's not going to be what it used to be. It's not going to be a forest. You do something like mountaintop removal for coal mine and you blow the top off a mountain, you can't make that a mountain again. Restoration, though, is where we take something like the Everglades and we make them a, a, a wetland again, or a, a prairie and we make it a prairie again. Um, so restoration, like I said, think about an old car. If you're restoring it, you're putting it back into its original condition. Um, yay. All right, let's go ahead and get your little boards out. Which concept describes the number of species in an area? Concept describes the number of species in an area. If you don't have it, it's fine. I got it. Look, you can read. You got it. Go. Like I said, when I made these for you guys, I pared them down. Number of species. Hey, it's not D. This is like that one time. That's funny. Maybe that's why I cut it out. All right. I see some people still thinking. All right, so it is B, species richness, yay. What is inbreeding, oh, what does inbreeding depression result in? So long. All right, so B is the right answer again, good. Why does Costa Rica have more bird species than Canada? Because, no, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to think of some jokes. I'm, I'm slap out of jokes. Because guns are illegal. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Remind me to tell y'all a funny story about the passenger pigeon when I'm done. It's very funny. All right, and A is, yeah, A is good. All right, which of the following is a major cause of extinction? Is the major cause of extinction? This is, there's a definitely the best answer here. Alex learned something today. Yay, Alex. All right, so C, habitat loss. Good. <laughs> yes. Biodiversity does all the following except... Alright, so C. Did you get it? I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. Which branch of science studies factors behind loss protection and restoration of biodiversity? You don't have this one, do you? That's because I thought it was dumb. Do it anyway. No, I'm just kidding. No, give it a try. It should just this is really simple, so that's why I took it out. I'm saying I was trying to say paper. It'd be a fun job, I think. You'd have to really want to do it. Uh, a? Okay, good. Which statement about biodiversity hotspots is not correct? All right, should be C. Is that all you have? Oh, one more. Do you have this one? No. Nope. Okay. All right, so we'll stop there. Um, I do have some practice questions on a website that I use for A 